you know, hi, I'm Corey. And uh, this is Woody. This is the ISOCast. have a sip have you been drinking a lot lately yep oh yeah yeah right into it yeah i've gone up i've gone up one or two um above and beyond my normal <laughs> my drinking quota is that like a, a daily quota <laughs> weekly quota yeah, what are we talking? Like, yeah normally in on the best of days i would have maybe one or two drinks some days none um but depending obviously during the winter there's like a few more that that slide into the uh, the Canadian winter boozing. Yeah, that's a real thing. Mm-hmm. I, I taught people um, of foreign origin this week, beer o'clock, <laughs> and what that is. <laughs> well, what is it now in, in the isolation world? What is beer o'clock? I just, whatever time, I think. What I used to do is say, wait till it's dark, right? When it's dark, go for it. Except in the summer, right? So I guess I already I broke my rule because the exception would be, it's like, well, it's 930. It's too dark. It's too late. So for me, it's kind of like, make sure I'm definitely done work. That's, that's kind of the first criteria. Yep. At least for the third one, for sure. <laughs> Almost done <Yeah>. work. <laughs> you know, uh, I've seen lots yep. of memes online. I'm sure everyone has, you know, it's, it's coffee time or it's wine time, you know? So you have your morning coffee and then when you're done the coffee, you open the wine or you have a beer or a drink. I think that seems to be what people seem to be doing. Um, I don't know if that's what your strategy has been, but I, I've been definitely cognizant of how much I've been drinking in the last week or two. Because at first it was like, all right, nowhere to go. Let's have some drinks. And now it's kind of like, well, I'm still I'm still drinking. <laughs> this is Maybe I need to tone it back a bit, but we uh, we're definitely buying buying lots of booze for sure. What I've what I've done, though, is is considering the current situation is, first of all, limit the number of times that I would buy alcohol. So because I'm an old guy at that 45 now, I would go to the grocery store on a daily basis. That's what old guys do. And at the grocery store, I would buy usually two beer, three if I'm feeling like frisky, but usually I'd buy two beer and I'd bring them home with me. The reasoning being if I don't have 12 or 24 beer kicking around as most Canadians do, I'm not going to drink more than the ones I brought home. I'd have to, I'd have to physically leave the house and make that decision to bring more beer in if I'm going to do it. And that's a good decision point I found. Whereas now because of the current conditions that we're under, it means that I necessarily have to buy a lot of beer. <laughs> I use the word necessarily in, in, in quotes. Well, you're just being, you're being efficient with your trips is what you're doing because I, I was at the beer store the other day uh, and we went over there and the line, I mean, the lines are, I don't know what they're like outside Montreal, but the lines here, you know, you're half an hour wait or something just to get into the store, which is great because it's a safety precaution. Wonderful. But it doesn't mean I'm going to go every day. You know, you do your weekly trip or something. So it feels like you're buying more and drinking more. I don't know if it's true, but I'm buying more definitely in bulk because I don't want to go back. Well, I am drinking more. It doesn't feel like it. I am. And that's a, that's just a measurable fact. I have an app that I, I keep track of things. I have a variety of apps that I keep track of things. My fasting app, my meditation app, my, my white noise app, my exercise app, my sleep app, my weight app, my drinking app. The more I think about it, uh, I've got a lot of metrics on my behavior, right? And it really helps because it gives me that sort of overview of the trend, what seems to be happening here. The irony is that though I've been drinking more in the last couple of weeks, I've been sleeping better than I've slept in years. And I don't think it's related. Mm. Okay. Uh, I wonder what that could be. I, I've been sleeping really well as well. I, I feel like there's not, I mean, you're not, we're not outside. Maybe we're expending less energy. Exercise has been an issue for me. I haven't been yeah. in normal, not that I'm a big exercise guy anyway, but you know, going for walks is pretty much the extent. And I've really pulled back on that lately as well. The walking has not been, been as much. What, what do your metrics tell you about your behavior? <laughs> <laughs> this, this dive, we can't put that matzo ball out there and not explore it. What, what's the, well, what, what conclusions yeah. are we drawing here? I'm found there's a couple of things depending on how late I eat. That's number one depending on the how late I drink, that's number two, right? Because, you know, if you eat late, you're not going to get to bed as early. And also, if you drink late, especially those carbonated drinks like like beer, those carbs usually kick in several hours after you had that beer. Oh, right? you so betcha. You're laying in beer, and see, listen, <laughs> you're laying in beer, and you're having a bed. And the next thing you know, you're bolting up because you just had a bunch of beer before bed. So that never works. Um, but for me, weirdly, 
and I don't know why people would care, but here it is. I, if I just were on like vacation, let's say my life is a, is a fucking snow day, which it seems to be now. I would go to bed naturally between three and four in the morning and wake up around 11 or noon. That's, that's my pattern. If I had no clocks, no alarms, no anything, nothing, no obligations I had to consider, that's what I would do. And lately, that's what's been happening because I have less, I have as much to do professionally, but I kind of have less to do in life, meaning I can just go to bed whenever and get up whenever. And it's been ridiculous. That's what happens. I, at four o'clock, I'm out. At noon, I'm up. And I sleep so well, like undisturbed sleep. It's beautiful. That's a fascinating observation because I'm the complete opposite. My normal pattern is go to bed early, wake up sort of early. So by like 10, 10 30, I'm pretty tired, usually going to bed. And that's not because I have obligations. That's just my normal pattern. And waking up, you know, seven, seven thirty, uh, normally. That's kind of my normal cycle. So I'm I'm kind of doing that still. Um, I haven't changed that much, but that's we're on the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. So this ap- afternoon recording session is a good time for you. This is why we're recording at three in the afternoon. And I've not taken any meetings earlier than 10 o'clock for, for years. But now I've actually changed my availability on, on my calendar. You know, you have those fancy calendars where people can book an appointment with you. And I don't take any of those till afternoon. I don't do any internal meetings till after two. Right. And it's funny because I always prided myself on being a morning person. I love the morning. And I do. I actually love the morning when I'm up. I don't love the morning when I've had less than eight hours and 15 minutes of sleep. Well, this is it, right? I think whatever there's research there that says people need seven hours every night uh, to to have what, what's considered a good night's sleep. So I, it doesn't I was surprised when I read this. It doesn't matter which seven hours those are. It just matters that you get seven consecutive hours of good, whatever that means, sleep. And it has mm-hmm. to be consistent. So your body has to be in this, in this habitual pattern. So you can't get seven hours from, you know, going to bed at 10, waking up at 5 a.m. one day and then going to bed at 3 a.m. the next night. It doesn't work because your body has to be used to the pattern. So, Corey, the news is maybe you're being healthier by going to bed at 3 a.m. every night. I am. And I've got the metrics to prove it. Not only am I getting the the duration of sleep that I'm looking for, um, this particular app is also measuring my sleeping heart rate dip, right? Which is related to heart health and the quality of your sleep. In addition to that, the the irregularity of your sleep is, is a metric that's measured um, because there's a lot of studies that indicate that if you get not only that seven or eight hour sleep, whatever works best for you, if you get that consistently at the same time, you're going to get better quality sleep. And then the the other metric that I think is is really fascinating is the amount of um, disturbances you have during that sleep period, right? What they consider rested, restful sleep. Um, how long are you like, you know, comatose, locked? You know, when you get into that, you know, when you wake up in a dream or you wake up disturbed and it takes a minute for your body to actually come out of that par- paralysis because you're you've frozen, like locked in sleep. Yep. Uh, and I, then at the end of it, there's two times a day that you kind of self-report, right? How have you felt today? And then you can indicate maybe some of the things that change during the night or whatever. Um, and at the end of it, you get this kind of long throw of data that really shows you what the pattern is and you can look at it and it'll give you the recommendations. Like you seem like you feel a lot better when you get eight hours and 15 minutes of sleep, consider getting to bed by X time, you know, and that helps a ton. The, the discouraging part for me is that the time is 3.30. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know? Well, it doesn't have to be discouraging. I mean, if, if that's what it is, that's what it is. If it helps you to get a good night sleep or a good morning sleep in this case, uh, then all the power to you, right? I don't think that's a big issue. It's it's just that, that, that app, it sounds simultaneously intriguing and very useful and also very creepy. I don't know how they get that information. You know, what, what does oh, I it, wear my Apple watch to bed? That's how does I mean. it do that? Like, what is it, it? Your, your pulse? Is that how it works or your rhythms? It's largely or? measuring a combination of your heart rate and then your movement. Right. So, you know, it's not detailed. It's not like there's a bunch of wires hooked up to my head or there's like a band under my bed. The idea is really just, it's measuring how much I'm moving around in the night and, and what my heart rate seems to be. Um, and that's, that's kind of enough to give you, I think a pretty broad stroke of what seems to be happening in the night. I don't know how much of this is being reported in China as I'm doing it. I don't really care. But for for me, the disturbing element is if you subscribe to the social construct that you should be getting up early in the morning, right? The, the notion that, you, you know, productive people get up early. And it's like, I'm super productive. I just get up at noon. 
and then I'm really productive. That's been pretty overly uh, dispelled, I think. Uh, productivity is doing things when you your body is the most productive. And for some people, that's six in the morning. And some people, it's three o'clock in the morning. So I think we have to understand when we are the most productive and then do the things during those time slots. But yeah, social the social construct is getting up early, as you say. And there's lots of actually, you know, I'm a teacher. So lots of educational departments in the world who are exploring moving high school to the afternoon because... Mm-hmm. Teenage, the teenage brain apparently needs more sleep and their cycle of sleep, you know, is going to bed later at night, waking up later in the morning, kind of what you're describing. So there's lots of school boards that are exploring the idea of having high school be, you know, starting around noon and going until, you know, six in the evening, something like that. And I think that's it. When are you most productive? And that's what you have to explore. This isolation, maybe the silver lining is we're learning our productivity cycles and what when we should be doing what we should be doing. It sounds like I am a, an adolescent. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer have gotten to those those points where I can sleep for, you know, 12 hours a night, right? As we did as teenagers. You could sleep for 12 hours and just shake it off and, and go about your day. But now, I mean, after about eight, I'm up. And at my age too, you know, your bladder gets you up at least at least once in the night, maybe twice. It seems the older you get, the more often you're going to have to get up to pee. When did that start? When were you? Do, when did you mm. notice the uh, the first urinary uh, <laughs> calling? Yeah, yeah. This is anecdotal. I don't know because I don't. I just I don't have the data points. I can say that it was definitely in my mid thirties that it's like, boy, I I don't seem to be able to get through a whole night without having to go to the bathroom. Um, the, the other was once upon a time I was a little worried about it because I was peeing a lot. Like I was just peeing all the time. You know, not like peeing my pants, but just like I. Boy, I use the bathroom a lot. I pee a lot. So I'm, I'm asking kind of for me here because I'm on an every other night basis. One night I'll sleep through and the other night I'll get up and I'll have to pee. So I'm kind of uh, doing a self-diagnosis here. I got I got uh, two opinions from two doctors, right? And one, she said, well, you drink a lot of water, which is great. You know, I drink a lot of water. It means I pee a lot. And then in the evening, she said, do you drink like tea or beer? I said, I drink beer. Sometimes I'll have coffee in the morning. She's like, yeah, you drink a lot of liquids and you pee a lot. <laughs> I'm like, I know that. That's why I'm here. He said, what? Yeah. Why do you need me to tell you that? You put a lot of liquids in and a lot of liquids come back out. That's how it works. I'm like, okay, is there something to worry about? And they're like, no. I said, what about my prostate? What about, what about, what about? And they're like, you, you, you drink a lot and then you pee a lot. That's it. So I don't know if that helps you. I'm not a doctor, but it made me feel a lot better. Yeah. You know, I, I drink a lot as well. Just liquids, liquids in, liquids out. Big coffee, you know, two or three cups in the morning, lots of water as well. Um, and then we've talked about the the alcohol stuff, <laughs> especially lately yeah. in the isolation phase. Um, before I ask you another question here, Corey, what <laughs> I was going to ask about your just your isolation habits in general. But have you heard of a book? I think this is up your alley. A book called Atomic Habits. No, have you heard of this? I have not. I no. just finished it. It's w- wonderful. I think you'd really enjoy it by James Clear, and uh, it, it basically is a book about how to establish good, simply, and bad habits. How to get rid of the bad habits that you have or that you don't want and how to start habits that you have always wanted to have and why it seemingly is very difficult to start habits. You know, you know, doing it one day, not doing it the next, not following through, not committing, not holding yourself accountable. Um, and he has lots of different strategies for habit stacking and starting habits. And I think that's especially appropriate now when you know, our clocks don't matter so much and we can kind of do things any time of the day that we like. But in doing so, I think there's two results and you seem to be getting on board with doing things that you want to do more so and doing them consistently versus the other mindset is I can do them anytime now because I have nothing else to do. And then the result is not doing them at all or any of them. So Mm. I think that book would be a really good one. I I like this. I think we're doing the book segment. (laughs) Okay, let's. Uh, I will check. You're, it, funny enough, I just finished a book, so I am looking for a fresh read. And on habit, I, I read maybe two years ago Peter Duhigg's book, uh, "The Power of Habit." Fantastic, right? Not only because it, there was a lot of things that were, you know, easily implemented into your own life, but things that could be, you know, broadly in, implemented into your business and explained a lot of business behavior as well. It was fascinating, great book. Um, so now, now I've got a new read. I just finished um, from that corny Ryan Holiday guy, um, Stillness is the Key. And, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's a reader digest kind of guy, 
right? Really, it's it's kind of broken into segments. It's very bloggy. It's um, it it suits, I think, kind of the the culture of readers that are up and coming today. And I have nothing to base what I just said on, but that's my sense is that people seem to like his work because of the way it's sort of broken up. I've I've read him. I he's verbose. Yeah. Uh, he's he, he, <laughs> yeah. he can use words beautifully. Like it's it's an, it's interesting to read to follow his his words, but then you get through three or four pages and you well, he hasn't really said, he's got one point. He hasn't, you know, three or four pages to get through one idea. He hasn't really said anything. I'm glad you said that. I found the exact same thing going through this last book. It was that, um, I enjoyed how the chapters were broken up because it made for a nice morning read. I would journal and then I'd read a chapter and then go about whatever it is I do all day. But the, the concern was, is that at the end of it, there was maybe sort of a pithy takeaway, but there was nothing substantive. There was nothing that I'm like, boy, this really has got me thinking and makes me want to dig deeper into it. It always felt like I, you know, I can see why people want to re- subscribe to his daily stoic newsletter as opposed to, you know, having something that's maybe just of consequence in your life. There, the things that are applicable, right? I don't like those kind of terse takeaways where, you know, it's like, oh, okay, there's something to think about, but you don't really think about it and you certainly don't apply it. And that's what I've always found his writing style was. And that, that's very bloggy to me. Yeah. Uh, well, I think he, that's how he started as a writer, wasn't he? Wasn't he a blogger? And I mean, I know he was a marketer. I've read two of his books, I believe. I've read Ego is the Enemy and mm-hmm. I've read Trust Me, I'm Lying, which is his book about how the marketing industry lies to us, essentially. Right. Both interesting. Um, but I find, and I do, I funny, I do subscribe to his daily stoic, uh, mailing list and some of them are quite interesting, but I find, uh, as a tangent, I got into this kind of genre because I read, um, Mark Manson's, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. And I thought that was, that was good. And I liked how he put that together yeah. and he kind of started this genre of not really, you know, counterintuitive self-help or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all the stuff now is, is like confirmation bias. It's reading Ryan Holiday because you already believe these things. And then when he says them, you just find yourself saying, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And you're just confirming what you already think. I don't think anyone's reading it and taking away something, like you said, where it's like profound and new. It's just, I already believe this. And now here's someone else who's writing about it. And that makes me feel better about what I already think. I don't think it's anything really helping anybody. Nothing is challenging your position. You know, I've never really looked at it that way. I, I think this is, I think we're seeing some segments come out of the show. There's the, what are you reading segment? Well, who, <laughs> or whatever you recommend. How many people in the and world then, have a big ego? Lots of people. How many people think they have a big ego? Probably not that many. So who's going to read ego is the enemy and be like, oh man, I need to change. No, they're going to say, oh my God, I know a person who's like that. That's the, that's the takeaway from that book. So I don't know really what the big purpose, I mean, it's, it's entertaining maybe, but I'm not sure that it's actually uh, progressive to, to self-help. It's light reading. At the end of the day, that's, you know, again, I kept coming through this and thinking this is all Reader's Digest because it's really not challenging you at all. Um, But, you know, at the same time, I think anyone who's a student of some of this information, just even on just that kind of cursory level, it means that they're investigating deeper into something that maybe they should right? It's, it's kind of like, I don't want to get on people's case because it's like, oh, you're a Buddhist. Do you do this, this, and this? Oh, well, you're not really a Buddhist. You know it's like, hey, Well, you know what? They're studying Buddhism. That's a good place to start. Give someone a break, right? Uh, for me, that's, that's kind of the point. You know, I have a friend and a colleague who recommended that book to me because it was for them almost transformational. It's like really made them stop and assess and evaluate things. I just, I just restarted a book called Essentialism because it really, that's one of those books that made me stop and think about what I think is important and what I'm doing, especially in my business and in my life. And, and equally, I, I just finished a great book called Stopping the Noise in Your Head about you know managing anxiety. And I liked those books because they challenged me. But the only reason that I got to those kind of things is because I did the light reading first. Right. I, I did the stuff. I read the ego as the enemy. I I read like the Dr. Wayne Dyer self-help books or the Deepak Chopra stuff that's, you know, cherry picking philosophy and science and making it into just kind of garbage that people feel good about. But because I did that, I, I said, OK, you know, what? I'm going to go a layer deeper here because none of this stuff is really challenging me as a, as a human. I like it. No, I think that's that's a good play. And I book recommendations are really tricky because what for me, for example, if I find a book really interesting or really deep or really profound or really helpful for me, it doesn't mean that it's going to be so 
for somebody else. I mean, I think anyone can get into a Harry Potter story and they can find it entertaining. But with the nonfiction genre, I think it's it's tough to, to recommend books because Atomic Habits was really interesting for me and I was able to Im- uh, implement a lot of those things into my life. But for somebody else, maybe they would have the complete opposite reaction. Can you give me an example of, of some habits that you've implemented? Yes. So doing the opposite, I do have a morning routine that I get up and I uh, I implement one of his things called habit stacking, which is you add a habit that you want to a habit that you already do. So I would always spend too much time kind of getting up and doing my email in the morning, uh, kind of delaying it and kind of, it would take too much time. So now I get up, I have my coffee and I've added the habit. So as I have my coffee, I do my email. And by the time I finish my first cup, I should be finished that task. And you, now it usually takes a max of about 20, 25 minutes. And I get up and I do it at the same time every day. And that's one thing that I check off my list and then I can move on to whatever task number two is on my list. I've been an advocate of this. This it sounds like, um, I don't know if this is cognitive bias, but this sounds like exactly what I've always been doing, <laughs> at least in the last 10, 15 years is, is starting to build. Um, I, I've always referred to it as putting a frame around your life, trying to build positive habits that you want to maintain on the, the tip and the tail of your day. And the idea is that framing your day with good habits means that eventually it might encroach into your life and start generating better habits throughout the day. Uh, for me, you know, my morning routine is, is two hours. I need two hours to be a happy guy for the rest of the day. Like I, I don't, I don't like getting up and having to jump into work or jump into a thing. Um, so for me, it's like, I need to, I need to wake up gently. Right? And then after I've woken up gently, I like to meditate for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then from there, you know, I'll make my coffee and then I will, uh, journal for a little bit and then I'll maybe read a little bit. So I kind of go through this process of easing into my day. And I guess that sounds like what they're doing here is really just kind of stacking one habit on top of the other and keeping it consistent. Yeah. And, and he, he talks about making habits, the, the path to making habits automatic, because when you do them automatically, they're not a habit anymore. This is what you do. So he kind of defines habits as something that you're building. And then when it becomes automatic, like coffee for me is automatic. I don't even think about making the coffee in the morning. It just gets made. I, I do it. I don't think I don't decide, OK, now I'm going to make coffee. It just happens because it's automatic for me now. So he says, there's, it goes through a whole category of you have to make it automatic, you have to make it attractive, you have to make it easy. So, you know, if you never go to the gym, you're not going to go to the, decide, okay, tomorrow I'm going to start going to the gym every day. Well, that's, you're setting yourself up for failure. So decide you're going to go once a week for five minutes. That's easy. You can do that. And then as you, you can add more days and add more time as you go through. But if you go to the gym for two hours one day, you're not going to go again for two weeks because your body's going to hurt. So it's a way of managing and incrementing your habit that you want to build. It's, it's, it was really good. I, I, I recommend it. It's probably not for everybody, but I really enjoyed it. Is there anything in there that, um, helps you to reevaluate habits you consider bad habits, those that you'd like to get rid of and take out of your stack, so to speak? Yeah. So he definitely talks about what things that you do, habits that you have now that impede on what could help you implement the ones that you want to start. So if you want to start reading for 30 minutes every day, because that's something that you think you want to do, what restricts you from starting that now? So there's only so much time in the day, so you can't just add all these habits. You're going to have to take away something. So if you want to read after you wake up for 30 minutes or 30 minutes before you go to bed, those are the the most common times that people read. What do you currently do in those time slots that you would have to remove? Or, or move to another time of the day. And are those good? If you're moving them, then dictate, are they good habits or are they bad habits? Do you want to keep them? Or do I not need to do those anymore and then replace them? There's an expression I once heard that, you know, neither Jesus nor Buddha had to take children uh, on a flight. And <laughs> what, I, what I liked about that was it, it means that it's very easy when you're a monk right? To, to undertake a lot of these different, uh, these patterns and these activities, but you know, life encroaches, you know, there's interruption constantly. Like for me, again, the the notion of, of setting aside the two hours a day that are really sacred allows me to, to get ready for whatever else and, and open myself up to that encroachment, if you will. So I think in terms of some of the bad habits, one of my things is I'd love to get to bed by 10. Who wouldn't? And just be asleep by midnight, I'm, I'm told. 
Um, but that's not possible. You know, we, we have people in our lives. We have things that we do. If I lived alone in the woods, I could certainly set up a really great series of habits and routines throughout the day. But I don't know how fulfilling that is, especially when you start taking away the spontaneity of life. Well, that's interesting too. So I, you know, I don't know if we can schedule spontaneity that kind of takes away the purpose of it, but, um, (laughs) but he also, he does a good job, I think of, of being realistic and saying, just because you don't do this habit every day, uh, that's okay. Just don't, I think he has, what he says is a rule of don't miss. It's okay to miss one day. Don't miss two. So when you miss two, it's the start of another habit. If you miss one day, that's life. But if you miss two days, then that's something else. And it's starting to build a habit of, of not doing it. So um, give it a read. If, if, if This is our book recommendation segment, <laughs> Atomic Habits, James Clear. Uh, it, was, it was good for me. Very good. Um, let's jump to, uh, I'm looking at the clock and I, I like this idea. If we can make 30 minute shows, this would be so cool. Um, what about if we end up talking to people, it'd be cool to talk about what are they reading? What are they doing? And what are they watching? What are they, what are they doing? What, what are we doing in isolation? No. How, it's, what, what's yeah. happening? You know? All right. Well, let's make this the, what are we doing segment? What, what are you doing? What are we doing? So what am I doing? We, my, my girlfriend and I, we just moved. So we're in settling into a new place. So we are, I suppose, busier than most people because that's kind of a blessing and a curse. Moving during the whole COVID-19 thing obviously was, was not ideal and we didn't plan it that way. Just kind of how it worked out. Um, but it's keeping us busy. We're set, we're mostly settled now, unpacked and getting, getting it looking the way that, that we want. And, um, so, so that's, that's, that was two weeks ago and now, uh, I'm still working. So that, I'm lucky in that sense, I'm a teacher and everything's been moved online and it's very different, but that does keep me a little bit busy as well. Otherwise, yeah, reading, podcasting, Netflix, better call Saul is what we're finishing season four. Mm. <laughs> better call Saul. I, I, I've been really blessed in that much of my lifestyle hasn't had to change so far. Uh, because, you know, I, I run my own business. I work from home. I, I'm a home body by nature. And, you know, we live on the the South shore of Montreal. Don't be creepy listeners. And it gives us a chance to not necessarily be part of the rat race in Montreal, but 20 minutes drive from it, right? It's just across the water. So for me, not a lot has changed other than obviously the the nature of the activities that we we would normally undertake. Um, our consumption has dropped tremendously. <laughs> we were buying a lot less crap. Ironically, um, I find myself watching less TV. I'm, I'm more purposeful about what I'm sitting down to watch for, for, I think, two reasons. One, I'm busy during the day. I don't have time to sit around and watch TV. And then the other is, um, you know, we've had some family move in here. So we kind of got a full house going on for safety reasons, because not living on the, on Montreal Island means that uh, we were able to bring some folks over so that, you know, they could be safer. You know, there's less of an outbreak here than there is like at the epicenter of Montreal. So for us, it's been also a lot of stuff's going on. There's cooking happening in the house. There's babies sitting. It's like a little mini family. It's fantastic. Um, So during the day, that's kind of the activities, meaning that I'm not sitting around watching TV. I'm, I'm going to my office or I'm going to my studio and I'm doing my work and I'm jumping out for a walk to get some fresh air and kind of air out every now and then. The the big change, though, has been like lately I am on an Al Pacino fest. I'm on day three. So when everybody's gone to bed, uh, I'm still up because, you know, 334, like I said, and I have just gone back and started going through the Al Pacino catalog and watching some fantastic movies, just great. You know, there's no circumstance under which normally I would open up scent of a woman and say, I'll oh, play that movie from 1995. Now I'm like, this is two and a half hours. This is great. <laughs> and it's so beautifully written and so perfectly paced. Right. So for me, that's, that's what I've been doing is, is doing what I normally do, ordering a lot of food online um, and being a lot more measured about what it is that we're buying. And then, you know, really um, just catching a movie at night to kind of wind down. I'm reading more than I've ever read in my life. Yeah, you know, my and I were just talking about that the other day. We're saving so much money because we're not, you're not buying anything. You're not going out. You're not doing mm-hmm. anything. So, I mean, there's going to be a big new normal, I think, after all this kind of settles down a bit is... I, Talking about self self help or self reflection, I mean, I think this whole experience is is 
forcing us or helping us in really review what you know our life choices and our decisions and in our case our, our purchasing decisions and we, we don't have the temptation of you know walking home from work and oh there's Chipotle or there's McDonald's or whatever and just going to buy it because well you can't be out there anyway so you know we're cooking more we're buying less um, reading more you know, I, I never watch the news I am watching the news a little bit I've stopped lately because there's not much new happening there but um, yeah lots lots of lots of uh, money saving, I guess is, is the word. Um, but I was going to ask you about, you know, your nothing, you know, not, not much has changed. I was thinking about myself. I'm a very a big time introvert. And I remember you saying that you, you have introverted tendencies as well. Do you find the, the staying home, um, more troublesome now or it's nothing's changed or you know there's no there's a dichotomy of choice because now we're, we can't go out versus before i preferred to stay in but has that changed the mindset at all there's a lot of questions in there i'll, I'll unpack it this way the the I'll, i'm going to link to an article that is read in the daily beast and it was on um those that are suffering through anxiety or depression are finding this an oddly uh, calming time right? for a variety of reasons. And I won't expound on the article, but I mean, some of the takeaways are that the thing, the big thing you've always been anxious about happening has happened, number one. And two, all of the symptoms of your anxiety or depression or what have you that uh, you've suffered with, everyone is suffering from in some degree. So there's a, a great amount of relatability nowadays. And I and a lot of the folks that I've spoken to have kind of fallen into the calm factors. Like, this is great. Like, obviously, the, the horrific, you know, toll that this is taking on families and lives. And I guess the economy is a thing as well that people seem to care a lot about. But if we can set that all aside just for a moment, the, so one of the pluses has been for me to answer the question is, I feel really good. Like, I'm very calm. I'm really enjoying this process of when you take away, like I have, I, I, I'm self-diagnosed generalized anxiety. I think that's, that's a lot of what I have. And for me, when you don't need to worry about what's going to happen next, because there is no next, it's pretty soothing. <laughs> it feels pretty nice. You know, where am I going to go and what am I going to do? And what am I going to, what am I going to, well, the answer is nothing. You're going to get up, you're going to go to work, you're going to take a shower if you remember to, and you're going to go about your life and you're going to spend time with your family and, and be as present as you can and, and communicate and call the people you care about. And that's that's a very easy set of, of parameters to manage for somebody with anxiety. Oh, yeah. That, that sounds very, very... I'm going to read the article. Daily Beast, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put it. Okay. I'll put it in the. I'll put it in the show notes. Put in the show it's notes. on my Facebook okay. page too. No, that's. So. I mean, <laughs> okay. I find it it eerily calming as well, and I think, you know, not to get too deep here, but you know, change is not something that we usually deal well with, but after some time, you realize that maybe some changes are good, and, and we're adaptable creatures, right? We're, you know, we're not going to go over for Easter dinner at the folks this year, but we're we're Zoom. We're having a Zoom Easter dinner. And you know what? That's okay. It's not the same, but it's, we're still going to be together. So um, we're adapting. And I think some changes will come out of this that that we might keep for, for the long term. Yeah, I, I think we're going to squeeze this big pimple of life. And um, once that goop comes out, what we'll be left with is a scar, but maybe, you know, cleaner skin. I don't know. That was a pretty stretched analogy. but the, I like it. It's a good visual, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. see it. I think, uh, why, why don't we just end it there? So I guess, you know, hi, I'm Corey. And uh, this is Woody. And uh, this is the ISOcast. Mm -hmm.